That ugly preseason is behind us. It's done. It is over with. Now, the next game matters. And I have to believe that the Sacramento Kings have some things tucked away that they didn't show us during preseason that we'll finally get to see come Thursday night. But what could those things be? Let's speculate. Jill Adge from the Kings Herald, Sacramento Kings super fan, joins me here on the Locked on Kings podcast to break down that, the preseason as a whole, and De'Aaron Fox's recent comments about his future in Sacramento. It's all right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can get a big return on FanDuel starting your season. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And before my conversation uh, with Jill is uh, is played for you here. I have some news. I teased this uh, a couple of episodes ago, but it is now officially public information. Locked on Kings has a newsletter. It is brand new this season, five days a week. You will wake up to hopefully a newsletter in your email inbox. If you subscribe, of course, it will feature an article written by yours truly and all the information you could possibly need about the Sacramento Kings and the NBA as a whole. I'll have some of the biggest headlines around the NBA outside of Sacramento, all the information and stories surrounding the Kings. And even for you fantasy basketball guys, some fantasy basketball and eventually, hopefully, some betting stuff will be incorporated in there as well. It'll be everything that you need each morning and a quick read through it, get everything you need to know for the day. So when you get to work and and meet with your other Kings fan coworkers, you can hopefully start your conversation and, and, and have everything that you need to know for that day. So this newsletter is like the podcast completely free and you can pre sign up for the newsletter now on lockedonpodcasts.com slash newsletter. That's where you can go. You will see this screen, this coming soon screen. And at the bottom, you see just enter your email and subscribe. That's all you have to do. Enter whatever email you want this newsletter to be sent to you. From that point on, you are good. You are set. You will get this newsletter sent to you hopefully almost every single day, five days a week throughout the season with all the Kings information that you need to know. Now, this is where I, I'm asking something of you. Look, you have done a phenomenal job supporting the Locked on Kings podcast over the years. I'm unbelievably grateful for the growth of this podcast and for the amount of people that listen and, and, and subscribe and are a part of it every single day. It truly means the world. This is the next step for this podcast. And we really want to show the Locked on Podcast Network that. Kings fans are are continuing to be engaged. So again, this newsletter is free to sign up for. If you would sign up and subscribe to this newsletter, it would help this show and help me out tremendously, right? I want to be I want the Sacramento Kings newsletter out of the entire podcast network to be one of the top, one of the best right away because Sacramento Kings fans are the most diehard, loyal, and engaged fans out there. And I've been telling everybody, I've been bragging about y'all. So back me up here a little bit, right? If you could go and subscribe to this newsletter, again, it's free. Just enter an email and you're good to go. That helps me out tremendously. It helps the show out tremendously and helps the network out tremendously. So please consider uh, doing that. It's also, if you go to my Twitter account at Matt George Sack, you will see the, uh, the, the link. I actually said it wrong. So I apologize. It's newsletters.lockedonpodcasts.com. So you go to newsletters.lockedonpodcast.com. You'll see all the different show logos. Of course, click on the Kings one. And then for you YouTube watchers, this page is what will come up and you just enter your email on the bottom. Bam, you're good to go. The first newsletter drops Monday. That is the first one. So NBA season is back. You will get Kings newsletters and articles beginning Monday, five 
days a week. So again, please subscribe to that. Now, enough of me blabbing about it. Let's get to this conversation with Jill Adge. A lot of great stuff involving the Sacramento Kings preseason that's now over. What we think the Kings have kept hidden that we'll see come the regular season starting on Thursday and some conversation about De'Aaron Fox and his future in Sacramento. It felt good to wake up this morning, head popped off the pillow, and I realized the preseason, that 0-5, all the crap that we watched over the last week and a half, it's over. It's done with. It doesn't matter. It, it is a. It, it does not have any effect on the Sacramento Kings. It's a fresh slate as they now turn their attention to the home opener on Thursday of next week inside the Golden 1 Center against the Minnesota Timberwolves. That being said, we can't forget the context of what we saw in the preseason. And to help me break that down, plus we're going to explore a little bit of what we think the Sacramento Kings didn't show us that we hopefully will see on opening night. Sacramento Kings super fan and, of course, of the, the Kings Herald, Jill Adge. She's an absolute legend in, in Kings fandom communities, and she's nice enough to be back here on the Locked on Kings podcast with me. Jill, it's good to talk to you. It's good to see you. It's always good to talk Kings with you. You articulated how I felt about this preseason, I think better than I tried to in my many attempts on social media. Basically, you said, you don't care about the wins and losses necessarily. You just wish it wasn't so ugly, right? Tell me about Correct. how you how you yeah. are. How, you, how would you summarize that preseason that we just watched before we can put it in the back burner and move on from it? I could be way off base, but I feel like the most we saw them look like themselves was like the first half of game one. At Agreed. home, and we had 115 offensive rating, 95 offensive rating after that. Oof. So I'm going to like I feel like that's us, mm -hmm. and we can like we can be that. Um, the defensive rating was bad, but like I that doesn't surprise me, right? Like when it comes to preseason and uh putting in new players and we had no bench for mm. the majority of preseason as well. Now, if that happens in the, you know, in the real season, then it, you have that conversation that you have for every team in the league and that you're pretty much screwed because anytime you are went down almost your whole bench, you're not going to win. Sure. You're not going to like, it's just, that's how it is. And so, um, I keep reminding myself of that is like, we're, we have not seen what the real rotation is actually going to be. Like we haven't, um, we haven't seen that. I feel like Mike was trying a lot of different things. I do feel like a lot of them were just getting their cardio ready. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's more than fair, right? Get yourself ready. Also with all the injuries, make it out healthy. Um, I was happy they sat Fox in the last game because for how many games did we see him grabbing, his um, last two fingers on his shooting hand, you know, after he was trying to make steals, shoot a basket, all that stuff there. I was like, just sit him down so we can, right. we can rest these fingers and and get ready for next week and everything that's coming. Um, so I just, I feel like you were getting a lot of kind of piecemeal things together. Um, but I just keep holding on to like that beginning half of the first game is like when, and it looked like they were trying, like, because they were at home and it was like they really wanted to show things. Um, but I also was listening to, you know, to Monk saying, like, they're tired because they're trying to find their legs, right? And that's kind of what I meant about guys are out there getting their cardio, trying to get ready. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Monk was in and Monk was out, was going through stuff. Um, but also for him, like he had said, coming back to camp, that was kind of his first back into basketball, too. Um, and then when Kevin comes back, it's going to be that same kind of way Lyles, um, we were, you know, for a lot of preseason, we were asking our two way and Isaac Jones to be Trey Lyles, which is right. a huge ask because we don't have anything else on the roster. Um, to me, more than anything about like the main guys, it showed how much we had kind of missed on the margins of the back end compared to other teams. Like mm. when our end of benches were playing other teams end of benches to me it looked night and day correct and to where yes there were some ugly on other teams but you could at least find a player or two when you're like okay like i can see like they're going to be putting in it you know the time on these guys right um and yesterday for miller on the clippers in the post game he was saying how 
He was in the G League last year. He feels like he has surpassed that, but he also understands it's a business and the Clippers are in, you know, their kind of situation and he doesn't know what's going to happen. But I feel like the guys at the end of the bench, more so in like Colby and Mason, where you wanted to see them kind of take a hold of these opportunities that were coming and they just kind of never, they, they didn't show up for me. Like I Mm. didn't. Um, I didn't see that. So to me, that's where for anyone that follows me knows I kind of love the the margins, the second rounders, that kind of stuff where like that stuff's kind of like to me where you have these teams like Boston, OKC and all that where, yes, OKC has had a lot of top and draft talent, but they also hit on their second round like they hit around the edges. Boston, because they're paying their stars so many, they've had to hit around the margins for sure they hit everywhere <laughs> like it's um that it's just i'm still kind of waiting to see that from monty on that end of you know can we bring some timberwolves have like five wings uh-huh. and that are just waiting and it like josh uh minot or minot like i'm trying to remember how to say his last name but he was one we liked a couple years ago and brought him in the king's facility he spent the last two years in the G League with Minnesota, and he might have just worked his way into uh, a roster ro- or uh, actual rotation minutes this year over Joe Ingles in Minnesota. Um, and then they still have Leonard Miller on the back end and um, Terrence Shannon Jr. and um, uh, the UCLA kid that they drafted from last year. Like you just see these other teams who are spending these develop like the development time on these guys. And I just feel like we don't do that. And then we're left wondering why are they not trading for these guys? Because we're also not developing them in the back end. So it's like, to me, the preseason kind of showed that more than like anything with the actual main group, because to me it's until I start seeing that in the, the regular, I'm not going to be like, it's just preseason. I wish the shooting was better, but, um, in terms of like, can we sustain ourselves if someone goes down? That's where I'm left worried again, similar to last year. Like we didn't have enough to hold us. I'm hoping DeMar will be, you know, right. will be that piece that will be enough. But, you know, until that happens in the regular season, you just, you don't know. And it sucks that these five games are the only games we have right. um, to actually go on. But I will say in the first two games that I think, you know, everyone's saying we didn't have the win. I do think if our main guys played longer, they would have won one of those two games and then it wouldn't have been like a, because it only fell apart when you had that end end of group come in and they, they couldn't beat right. The, um, the, um, here's Jackson David, like they couldn't, they trace Jackson David. They, they, which I wouldn't expect our end of group to be able to do, or, you know, pods, like those are your, moody like those are the guys they were going against so um that i think that's where it was where we kind of forget that like they could have had those two but it would have been a big ask for your end of bench to also outplay those guys at the end and those guys did what they were supposed to do and right took it back in and got the win today's episode of the locked on kings podcast is brought to you by Game time. Game time is the site or the app that you need to use and you need to go to to get your tickets all season long. And I'm not just talking about Sacramento Kings tickets. Maybe you're an NFL fan, want to go see an NFL game, MLB game, whatever the sporting event is, even college. Or maybe you're into concerts, theatrical productions, comedy shows, whatever it is. Game time has the tickets for you and they have the best prices that you're going to find. Their flash deals are incredible. The closer you get to the event, the better. The prices are going to be, and they have this uh, game time picks filter, which takes all the fluff out. It'll only show you great deals on great seats. So you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets for the area and the price point that you're looking for. Game time uh, has an all in pricing feature as well, where it'll show you exactly what you're going to be paying up front. No more hidden fees hitting you on the final window uh, at checkout. The seat views on game time are better than you're going to find everywhere else. So incredibly accurate. Their lowest price guarantee cannot be beat. They'll credit you 110% of the difference. Plus their ticket coverage is phenomenal as well. They will work with you if anything happens or uh, for any kind of emergencies or things like that. So go and take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time picks, download the game time app, create an account and use promo code locked on NBA for $20 off 
of your first purchase. Terms apply. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. One thing you said there that I completely agree with, and this is where I'm trying to get back to my optimistic nature and what I'm hoping for, like the first quarter of game one was like, this looks great. And the Kings still weren't shooting the ball well, like from three-point range, but still half-court offense, DHOs between DeMontis Sabonis and, and DeMar DeRozan. DeMar goes six of six. Like he, they looked fantastic. You were like, okay, this is what I was hoping to see. What I'm optimistically trying to spin here, Jill, and tell me if you're on the same wavelength or not. I'm wondering if after the Kings showed that, Mike kind of backed off of it or they said, okay, we know this works. We believe this was going to work and we know this works. Let's try and experiment and try some other things because we didn't see the same level of fluidity on offense. I don't think at any other point throughout the preseason with that starting group, they had good moments game two versus the Warriors. I like that they fell behind by double digits early worked back to only down like two or four by the end of the first quarter. So there were good moments, but the way that first quarter looked was like, naturally this is how this offense should run. And then it never looked like that again. I have to believe with the hope that I have that the Kings have a box of classified sets and things that they're now going to open up and show us come the games actually mattering. I'd like to believe that they saw what they needed to see and said, okay, let's back off on that a little bit and let's try other things and see if they work or not. And for the most part, they didn't work. Yeah. And I will say, and I can't remember if it was Monk or someone else in one of the after practice interviews, they said that they weren't going to be running any actual like offensive sets. A lot of it was going to be read and react. And yeah, so was Mike. I think, okay, was it Mike? So I think that's kind of important to remember that. And even Mike wasn't calling, I mean, he did call timeouts after bad defensive possessions, I sure. think to kind of even get in on the young guys, like, that, you know, yeah. we can't do this. Right. Um, but I don't feel like he did that offensively where it was like, all right, come back. Like, we're going to do this now to fix it. Right. And I even think yesterday where we kind of had that bleeding, what was it like 17 to two moment where I do think in the regular season, you're going to have DeMar like stop that where I was kind of surprised yesterday. He did it, but mm -hmm. I also feel like he wasn't as aggressive and was kind of trying to let other guys kind of do their thing. And I do think he was kind of mostly out there for, the cardio. He's a 15 year vet. He knows what right. he has to do. Um, and I think it was like, make it through the game, right? Like make it through the minutes. I have to do your thing. Um, you know, and, or we could have had Monk stop that. Like, I do think, you know, in the regular season you would have had, or Mike hopefully would have called a timeout. Like, I don't think he would have let it, let it go on like that. Um, but yes, I do think definitely that that first, again, that first half of the preseason game, the offense looked completely different. And it, like you said, it wasn't even because they were making shots, you know, they were still missing things and all that, but it, there was a fluidity, right. right. That, that they were running and, and things like that. So, um, I a hundred percent agree there that I do think that that's more what you're going to see, you know, mm -hmm. coming into it. But the other thing too, is they were going against teams like Portland and Utah who, are filled with young players, not only just trying to make a team, but also fighting for starting spots, mm -hmm. bench minutes, all that kind of stuff. So I do think for each team, like they have their own reasons for, you know, doing what they're doing and playing the way they're playing. But again, asking our starters did play. Yes. A good portion into those, but you, I felt like you always saw a big difference when the, Starters came out and then you started intermixing the end of bench guys, even sure. with starters trying to keep it afloat. And again, like those teams sh should have young players better than right. Our like end of bench guy, like those guys are going for starting spots, mm -hmm. um, regular bench spots. Like they're not necessarily, they're not going to be going against your 13, 14, 15 guys, you mm -hmm. know, on a normal basis. And so, um, if they weren't better than our 13, 14, 15, then I would be worried about, you know, those teams. But sure. I think those those guys had a lot to play for. And, you know, it it made sense to me that you could see a difference in I don't even want to say the care, but like or the tri factor. But I thought I don't was it on with D and Casey yesterday, you were saying that it kind of felt like 
the losses we saw against Mm -hmm. like the bad teams last year, like it had those same kind of feelings. And I know it's also like fresh in our mind, but it was like that, that it's like our guys were just going out there, going through the motions and those guys are still, you know, fighting for their NBA, right? Like, um, lives you can say and so i just think there's a different kind of wants in terms of what you're trying to get out of these um preseason things i don't think that they liked losing every game but i also no. don't think that they even were like right. i think sitting fox and monk and all that kind of showed that it's like you know whatever happens happens locked on kings also brought to you by FanDuel. and nba fans you can start the season with a big Return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the exact same page where you place your bet. So, okay, you have the game open in front of you. You're watching. You get a hunch. You have a feeling, I think I know how this game's going to go. I think DeMar DeRozan's going to have a really big quarter here. I think the Sacramento Kings are going to cover the spread and are going to win by this much based off of what I'm seeing. You open up FanDuel right in front of you. It's going to have all the information right there so you don't have to open, have a bunch of windows open or be looking on your phone for certain stats while you're trying to find the right best. No, it's all right there in front of you. You make the best decision with your money and hopefully make money on that high Kings or sports IQ that you have. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. $5 on whatever. Win or lose, does not matter. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed at FanDuel.com. Well, let's spitball. Let's speculate a little bit. What do you think? Because you, not in addition to your knowledge of of everything Sacramento Kings, you also have a really good knowledge of of coaching and coaching staffs and and what they bring to the table too. And Jay Triano has the keys to this offense, and we know Jay Triano is an offensive genius. Uh, so, what do you think? Whether it's offensive related, defensive related, with Luke Louts at the helm. Give me kind of some ideas of what you would imagine the Kings maybe have in this classified box that we didn't see at all during preseason that we will see come the start of the regular season. We might not see all of it on opening night, but like, for example, you talked a little bit about Mike talking about we didn't have any drawn up sets, right? They just kind of played schoolyard, read and react basketball. And that's still a large portion of how this team is going to play going back to the last couple of seasons. Mike wants his team to read and react and move off of each other. And DHOs a lot with DeMontis Sabonis. But there are going to be set pieces and set situations, especially in moments like late in a quarter or the Kings are on the wrong end of a run and they just need a bucket to stop it. And you have a guy like DeMar. That's where I think we're going to see more of kind of the genius of Jay Triano come out. It's like, okay, let's stop the bleeding. Let's get DeMar free here on an ISO. Or Keegan, less of you trying to create yourself. Let's run you off of an off-ball screen and have a catch-and-shoot look from three-point range. We didn't see that much during preseason. So those are, those are some of the things that I'm really going to be keeping my eye out for come Thursday night, opening night, when we start to see a little bit more of what the Kings actually have planned that they've been working on all training camp and all preseason they just haven't showed it to us yet yeah no i'm with you and i'm curious because we know jay has coached demar before but that Mm -hmm. was also his rookie season and so a lot has right a lot has changed but he also credits jay for being like one of the main guys that you know that was telling him like you're made for this, right? Like that, that you're going to be at least based on his book and the stories that he kind of told there, Um, which is cool. If you haven't, if anyone hasn't read it yet, go read it. Um, It's a great insight into, um, you know, kind of how he is and where he is um, at this moment. But um, I get, I mean, and I will say Sabonis and DeMar, right. All off season have talked about their two man game. Mm -hmm. Um, and how unstoppable they think it's going to be. They were, according to Sabonis, they were getting, um, DeMar uh, in LA was getting up at like 6.30 a.m. And they were, you know, he was meeting with his trainer and then Sabonis would come in and start playing with them. And then uh, Christie's there and Barbosa's there. And Mm -hmm. it's, you know, they'd have a couple of hour long workouts. And then Boogie Ellis was there with them, Mm -hmm. you know, working out. And so um, I'm really interested to see how they they mix this together and how they mix it together when we get all the pieces back right like sure. i'm curious how herder looks mm-hmm. with with this group and how much more spacing like if we can get kevin back to that like year one kevin where kevin durant was saying 
I don't know how the hell you stop these guys because right. they hit you everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to get back to that where it's, there's nothing defensively we can do to stop these guys because they are hitting you from, from every area. And so I know we're all hoping to, to see that. And I do think they have all the pieces right again to get back there, but also you need the shots to start, um, to start falling that way. And I will say, I'm curious if the shooting, if the threes kind of keep going roughly, I think they average. They was like twenty six percent for the awful. for awful. all of preseason. Um, I felt like a lot of times they shot themselves out of games last year. Mm -hmm. That is there a switch that they've put on that, and maybe mm -hmm. having Demar will kind of uh, force them to put a switch on that. I don't know. So that's something I'm kind of interested to see if that stays the same or just because. I do think the three point number is going to go up because I realistically, I don't think everyone's going to not be able to shoot, <laughs> shoot threes. Like that's what's happening right now that it's, it's not like just one or two people are missing. It was the everybody. whole group was missing. Well, I would say everybody, but Boogie Ellis, he hmm. shot 38.9%. Fox was 31.8. Keegan was 25.9. Keon was 29.4. Doug was actually 36%, so there's that. Um, and one 36.4. And but the but that was also my thing is two days after pulling him off the street, like he outplayed yeah. <laughs> your like end up guys, right? He knows his which job, I love, which I love about him. And I know that Mike cold told him to go out there Just and shoot. play off as a bonus like you do and shoot it. Like right. that's because that's going to be your job. And so I love that he did that. Like, even if it was kind of bad at times, I'd rather I'd rather him be shooting him because there's a higher percentage. He's going to make it sure. than some of the others. Um, DeRozan with pleasant surprise is actually 42.9. So, OK, so he we'll was actually that. he actually had boogie there. Um, Jordan started off hot, but was it then 27.3? But he's a career 40 percent shooter. Not totally worried. Mm -hmm. He and the game that he played his role is when he succeeded, right? right you talking when he kind of was forced to do more than what your role was, then it's coming back. I also know he's coming back from the ankle, so that's got to work its way out. Um, and then Mason Jones was 20%. That, that disappointed rough. me to where... Yeah. Because in Stockton, his role is a shot chucker, right? Like he flings that, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he has a good percentage down there. And which is why I know they were excited about him, you know, coming up and getting this opportunity here. He didn't get it. Colby Jones wasn't making his shots either. I, I don't know. I, I feel like he's just mentally in his own head right now. And that's, that's what's going to take for him to kind of turn it around. If that's, if that's going to happen. But um, yeah, like it's again, Minus two people there. <laughs> it's everyone was missing. Monk was making the uh, the first right the first game he played. He made him, yeah. but he had three points right in that last game. Where how many times is that going to happen? Right. right? Not you, concerned you about lost. That. You lost to Utah by what? What was it? Three points. Fought, and uh, Monk only had three points. Like mm -hmm. that's not going to be very. You know that's rare, right? Mm -hmm. So again, when it comes to that game, like that's my thought process. Yes, we lost, but how many times? Is that going to happen in a game? You just don't want it to be against the Jazz in the regular season because those are the games that you need to you need to win. But I'm hoping those three point percentages don't again follow through because yes, guys are going to have slumps, but to me, it's just st statistically rare that you have everybody going through it at the same time. We just happen to get it. Um, this preseason where I will say I'd rather have it now than, you know, than happen, happen later. So um, that's something they need to address, but it's also something we were worried about, right? Is the shooting going to be there for this team? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever going to be this bad, but I think last year we even had those concerns when they kept kind of chucking them up and they weren't going in. Like, are we going to, um, adjust, especially when you have guys that can make middies. Like mm -hmm. that was my thing. And I know in this league, like if you can't hit threes, it's hard to win games because other teams are going to be hit, you know, hitting their threes. And so 
I think that's kind of the fine line the Kings are going to have to work out this year in terms of what you said, hoping to see on offense. I think there's going to be that fine line and just they have to make enough to win, but also know when it's not working that at least kill to keep yourself in games with your middies. And then, you know, because even when they were hitting middies against these other teams, they were still in, in the game, right? right. Like they were, these games were still winnable. It was just, you need to hit the other ones when, when it matters. There were a couple areas of preseason that were actually complete successes. And these are, the, these are the couple of the areas, a couple of areas that the Kings were very transparent about things they're working on. Offensive rebound and second chance points were fantastic. Some people are saying that offensive rebounding was a catch 22 because you were missing shots. So you have more offensive rebound opportunities. My response to that is what do you want them to do? Not follow their shot and just watch themselves brick all night and then get back on defense. Like they, they, it doesn't matter if the shot's going in or not. What Mike is trying to hit and, and, and implement and teach is every single play. If you're in those crash zones, you crash no matter what. If the ball comes off the rim and you have a chance to get it, fantastic. If it goes in, even better. You made a shot. That's the whole point of the offensive possession. So it's building those habits. The Kings generated a boatload of second chance points, uh, a boatload of offensive rebounds, which would have been near the top, if not at the top of the league last year, statistically. And they got back out in transition and started running again. Like their fast break points that they were generating per game. Again, small sample size, but it's all we have to go off of. Would have been top of the league last that year. That Portland game was wild. I, I mean, it was it was beautiful Crazy. in terms of of in terms of the transition it offense like, and what happens when you get the stops. You know, right. and how easy it is for you. So those areas were were really positive, and that shows that okay, in areas that they were really focusing, they had success, which gives me. Again, hope that the areas that they've been focusing on behind closed doors that they haven't showed to us media, media members that they didn't showcase at all during the rate uh, during the preseason come regular season time when they start to bring those out. How good will those look? Because I promise you, I, I, I got to walk through with other media members of some of the things that the Kings are working on offensively. Many of it I, I, I cannot share. There's a lot of it they didn't show us, but from what they did show us and I didn't see a ton of it in preseason, I'm like. In theory, this should be unstoppable, but that's theory. I'm ready to see it actually in actuality implemented against a really good Minnesota Timberwolves team on Thursday. Yeah, I will say another bright spot for me too was uh, Sabonis and his aggressiveness. Yes. I know there were times he, he even missed a couple bunnies, right? Like, but that's just Sabonis. Yes. But he, I mean, he was aggressive. Like he yeah. he was looking for a shot. He was going for it. I know the threes weren't falling, but to me, they weren't even Shoot ugly them. shots. Like Shoot they, them. I mean, I think could be wrong, but I think they will start fall, start falling. I mean, his mm -hmm. shot looks good. Like they don't look ugly in terms to me of um, where you see some of them and you're like, oh yeah, stop shooting. Like I didn't get that feeling with him. Same. Um, and, and I know Mike was giving him that green light and I don't necessarily, I don't know if he's going to take that many in the regular season. Like we're hearing that Mike wants him to. I don't know if it'll happen, but I did appreciate like him doing it. But man, his his mid range looks good, so much better. And they were sagging off of him, and he was just like, "Okay," or I should say, "Left." Okay, yeah. um, and they looked good. Like most of them were like swishes. They were right there. They had the nice arc to it. Um, and I know Doug and Barbosa have been working a lot with them on that. And so, um, to me, I thought that was that was a really pleasant surprise. Um, that pretty much every every mid range shot he took, I feel like maybe only one missed. I want to say I, like all, almost all of them went in, so that mm -hmm. that was good. And then I don't know if it was just me, but it almost felt like he was pump faking less too. Mm -hmm. um, where there were times last year where I'm like one pump fake less, like and you're you're up. And I know he does it um, to draw fouls and things like that. Right. And then I will say I think it was I think it was last game. He was 78% from the free throw line or 80%. So, I mean, there was little improvement there. So sure. if he's going to be getting fouled, making those. Um, so, but I will say like to me, his game that I thought he looked like he was ready to go. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just seeing him stand there and hold the ball and just like survey everything and just be like, dink to like right. you know to to every player is just it's beautiful to watch like it's it is 
and again with Sabonis, I feel like there was such an emphasis on his and DeMar's two-man game in that first quarter or first half of game one. And then the Kings just went away from that or didn't do it as much. And I think it's because they know it works and they just didn't need to keep doing it. Like they wanted to try other things. So I expect we'll see a lot of that come game one. Well, the last thing, Jill, I wanted to talk to you about, I wanted to get your reaction to this. I'm sure you've seen it. Sam Amick wrote an article for The Athletic and talked to De'Aaron Fox in this article. Talked to Fox, uh, uh, DeMondis Sabonis and DeMar DeRozan, but Fox is kind of the main guy that people are talking about because of his comments about why he turned down a recent three-year contract extension. This should be, for people paying attention, this should be no surprise. He's eligible for a Supermax contract if he makes all NBA uh, one of the next two years. That's what he's going for. But in addition to that, Fox spoke about kind of the stability in Sacramento. He said, for one, I'm in no rush. For two, I just want to make sure where we're at because people have seen the league, like turnover of a team can happen in a matter of a month or two or six months. I mean, if we're contending for a championship, it might be different. Like, obviously, the Boston Celtics, Jason Tatum, just won a championship. Or the Miami Heat's Bam Adebayo, who has been to the finals twice. I'm just using people who are in my class who have signed extensions. They've already kind of been through that, done that. So, yeah, they have that security of having done that. For me, obviously, we're continuing to build. He goes on to continue to talk about he'd love to spend his entire career in Sacramento if it makes sense. But paraphrasing the rest of it, Jill... Essentially what Fox is saying is like, I'm I'm not in a rush to sign this contract extension. There is more money potentially for me on the table. And I want to make sure that I'm not committing myself to an organization that is not moving in the right direction. I want, before I share my thoughts and, and feelings on this, because I don't want to influence everything. What was your reaction to, to yeah. those words from Fox? I mean, I kind of feel like it was the same thing that was said last year, right? When this got brought up again last year. Um, and that to me, I thought there were a couple key ones where it was like, I don't want to keep fighting for the plan. I mm -hmm. want to keep being in that three to six range where I'm in the playoffs every year, giving myself a chance. And I think that that's fair for any player to right? that. That's, that's what any player wants, right? right? A chance. And in terms of using Tatum and Bam, those are his best friends. So, sure. and you're having a little bit of FOMO there. Mm -hmm. And I will say for Bam in terms of Bam, He's been there, but I also wouldn't say that Miami's in a greater situation than Sacramento True. at the moment. True. But that can always change because it's Miami. Um, but they're also in the East. So I do think that there's, you know, it's it's not as cutthroat as yeah. as the West is all the time. Um, but I I don't want people to read that and not think that like Fox isn't pressuring himself to like do, you know, to do what he needs to do. I think there's enough of a, I need to do what I need to do. And then I also need the organization to do what they need to do. And to me, it's all the stuff that we have said that like, mm -hmm. we want them to do mm -hmm. right. Um, stay on the course and keep, just keep improving. Like, and even if keep improving, it's staying in that like three to six range where you're in the playoffs, <laughs> that's consistent improvement, right? Because we haven't, we haven't had that. And We've in uh in the 10 seasons that we've had winning basketball in Sacramento, Fox has now been a part of two. Right. So as much as we can say, like we're frustrated and all that, but I can also understand as a player, you know, wanting more. But I will say even something else caught my eye more so than anything Fox said. And it was Sabonis when they were talking about DeMar. And I don't know if other people caught this, but Sabonis said, here we go again, another miss. And it was in parentheses, it says another miss. DeMar ended up not being another miss. But to me, if that's the mentality that they're having, then I can kind of see why Fox is saying, like, I want to make sure I keep, you know, that we keep improving because we've seen Monty try and take these hits mm -hmm. and miss. And so I also don't blame Sabonis for thinking, here we go again, because nothing was happening. Right. Um, you know, went on to talk about how he had been talking with Wes and Monty constantly over the summer, like, you know, you hey, what's, yep. what's going on, guys? Um, and so I, I do think that that speaks volumes. These guys want to be here, but they also want to, you know, make sure that the talent is there, too. And that's not to say that they don't need to bring what they need to bring. Because mm -hmm. they absolutely do. Mm -hmm. But I do think that even outside of anything Fox and Sabonis are saying, 
if they're not getting better, Monty's not safe for Vivek anyway. So sure, like all sure. of this is a, and the players know that too, you know, after being in this organization. And so I get, you want that stability. You want the winning. That's kind of what I took out of it. Look, these guys know that inherently they are expected to be great and they're paid like it. So I think what Fox is vocalizing here and, and Domas a little bit too is the organization is expected to hold up their end of the bargain as well. Look, Fox has dedicated his entire career here to Sacramento and only recently has found success. And I know some people have issues at times with Fox's demeanor after losses and stuff like that. If you, Jill, I know you remember this. A handful of seasons ago when the Kings were losing every night, Fox was taking the podium looking pissed off and miserable. He doesn't oh, look yeah. that way anymore after losses. And it's not because the Kings are winning more than they're losing. It's because I think he's learned and matured and figured out, like, I can't, it's not good for me to feel that way. Right. And right. Kings fans well, and you like, know oh. it makes it, and you know it makes clickbait material. Like, it's 100%. going out and it's getting everywhere. 100%. Yeah. So Fox is very savvy about all of this. So I don't, it's not, there's nothing not team player about what Fox is saying at all. There's nothing bad about it. Like we all expect and need the organization to continue to improve. So again, it goes back to this word accountability that we've heard throughout this organization from the second, really that Mike Brown was hired accountability. That is, and, and that's what Fox is asking for and expecting here. So if anything, like you said, Fox is echoing what the fan base is calling for competitiveness. And if, if, if Fox feels that by the time he's about to sign this contract extension, that the Kings are once again moving in the wrong direction and their prospects are not good, yeah, he's going to be hesitant to commit another five years of his career on paper to this organization. That being said, Jill, if he does become eligible for the Supermax contract and the Kings throw money in front of him that only they can give him, I have a hard time imagining he's going to walk away from that. So I, I think this is all kind of a moot yeah. point in that sense. If and he even even an if NBA he player. right even if he made the All Star team again and didn't make All NBA, I and they offered him maybe even somewhere in the middle of it or that, and they're winning. I have a hard time imagining him turning it down again. I like agree. I don't know, but I have a hard time that it's not just like All NBA or nothing or championship sure. or nothing. I do sure. think there's that kind of fine line. But I also think, like, as these contracts get bigger, kind of what I was saying my worries earlier about Monty hitting on the margins, like, I think that that gets even more important yes. as you start going along. And even what Keegan's coming up for extensions, all that kind of stuff, like, you really have to start hitting on those margins. And so I do think this team has to start being better. Um, the front office has to start being better in, in those terms. And... Do they keep holding out for those stars that they're not getting? And do they start making some of these other margin moves? And I think that that'll be the interesting thing to watch this year, more so than anything else as as we go along. And to add that, I'm excited to see what Kevin Herter comes into mm -hmm. because right now, based on hearing him talk, he has a real fire under him. And mm -hmm. I, he even wants that starting spot back. Like sure. I could see him coming in and... And, you know, and, and fighting in that way too, that, um, that I want to get back to, you know, that player I was saying he's not wearing the headband anymore and doing all these things. Um, I think it's going to take a little bit, right. For again, his shoulder to be where it needs to be, but I'm excited to see how he comes out and plays and knowing that he's also our greatest, you know, trade asset at the right. moment you right. know, when it comes to, to this too, like, but also if it's really working, then I can see them not necessarily, you know, making that trade either. And then you have options with Lyles and you also have your MLE option now where you can trade into the MLE where that's mm -hmm. new, mm -hmm. um, where guys like Dorian Finney Smith fit in that, right? Like th there's ways that, um, they can go out and kind of still hit those margins while not necessarily even sending any players out. So, um, but yeah, in terms of all these contracts things, like that's where Monty has to really start to me improving on, um, those edges. And Herter's on a killer contract too, which is important to pay attention to. He's on a very, very good team friendly deal for his skill set, assuming he gets back to what he was doing a couple of years ago. Well, Jill, the next five days are going to be 
Very, very important for the Kings. They got some work to do, clearly. And then Thursday, it all begins. There, this season, there's a lot of expectations on this season, but that's an exciting place to be in considering what we went through for 15 plus years of just, hey, hopefully they'll be fun. Now it's hopefully they'll compete in a very, very, very difficult Western Conference. So I'm looking forward to this season, Jill. Keep up the fantastic work that you do. Jill is a phenomenal follow and conversation to have uh, on King's Twitter throughout the season, also at King's Games as much as she can be as well. Jill, I appreciate you. Can't wait to have you uh, join me again on the podcast very, very soon, and I look forward to seeing you at the Golden One Center. Thanks, Matt. It's a pleasure as always. Huge thank you to Jill Adge for joining me on the Locked on Kings podcast today. She's the absolute best, uh, an amazing Kings fan, an amazing Kings fall, so go and uh, check her out. Again, one more time, I'm going to ask you and remind you, New Locked On Kings newsletter. The first one drops on Monday. Sign up now on newsletters.lockedonpodcasts.com. Click on the Locked On Kings logo and you'll be taken to this page, this coming soon page. Enter your email. You can subscribe right then and there. And then the newsletters with articles written by yours truly will show up in your inbox five days a week, giving you all of the King's information that you could possibly want or need. I really would appreciate if you could do that and sign up uh, and, and send Locked on a message, letting them know that Sacramento Kings fans are the best, not just in the NBA. They're the best in sports, but I already know that. Appreciate your support. As always, can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.